morning we're going to get into Philippians chapter 4 and uh, let's look at verse 6. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do and the God of peace shall be with you. From this passage of scripture we have been learning how to overcome anxiety. From verses 6 to 9 the apostle Paul gives divine remedy to battle the deep concerns of the heart. We want to take a little review and see uh, what the poor has been saying to the church. Allow me to take about five to eight minutes in the way of introduction to have a review leading up to verse nine. You understand that the church at Philippi had legitimate concerns and worries and fears and poor uh, is trying to help them understand how to deal with them. You know, the church wasn't really in bad sin. They weren't really, uh, you know, facing sin in their lives or they were in uh, gross sin or uh, like the church at Corinth they were just discouraged uh, they were disheartened uh, uh, and they were moving away from what God called them right from the beginning when the church started and so he Paul is trying to plead with them to how to deal with certain things in the church and specifically with their discouragement worries and fears and he says by saying in verse 6 be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer he says first come to God you want to deal with your worries and fears come to God and we come to God in prayer and he says then supplication supplication has to do more than just coming or calling on the Lord it has uh, this uh, connotation of pleading of uh, of persisting and coming before God in a disposition of crying out if you will uh, coming to prayer is, is coming or calling but Supplication is crying to the Lord, and this is what he wants. Uh, it was Weasby that said, God is not looking for half sincere people in their prayer. Half-hearted, insincere prayers. He's looking for someone that is sincere. The psalmist said, I cried to thee, O Lord, and unto the Lord I made my supplication. And so what God is looking for is someone that's going to come in a serious manner with their problems. Not in an indifferent way, but in a serious, serious approach of God. Not in a casual, indifferent, uh, two-minute prayer won't fix it. It's a pleading and crying and searching and knocking and seeking and asking. And we touched on these things. But he also says with thanksgiving, and we said that to have complete cure is to come, cry, and be content in the Lord. With thanksgiving, when you come to God and you thank the Lord, it, make, it, it is it's a sign of contentment. And not only this, but it puts you in remembrance of his goodness. Because you understand that problems and fears and worries and concerns hinder our vision. Right. Now, it mars our vision of God's goodness in our life. But when we come before the Lord in thanksgiving, it reminds us of how good he's been. And how good he is. Because he's a good God. He never changes. And then... If you put all in the nutshell, Paul is just really saying, stop worrying and start praying. That's all he's saying. Uh, turn your worries into prayers. Pray more, worry less. And when you start to be anxious, stop, come to God, cry out to the Lord and be content with him. <clears throat> and, uh, it's, and, and so many times we've, we've mentioned in the first part of this verse 6 in, in, the, in the preaching that he's the last one we turn to. But he ought to be the first one we turn to. And then in verse 7 promises that we'd have the peace of God which passeth all understanding. That keep, look at this promise, it keeps your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. The result in coming to the Lord in prayer is to have the peace of God guarding our hearts from all the trouble that we allow in. God wants to be your burden bearer. He wants to carry those fears and troubles. And many a times we carry them unnecessary, we bring unnecessary discouragement, and we also spoke about those things. And so the second dose, if you will, or the, or the portion of instruction that he gives us is found in verse 8. We looked at that last week. we replacing bad thinking with God's thinking. Amen. Consecrated thinking. Holy, holy thoughts. God's thoughts. And the greatest discouragement we spoke about last week was the fact that we have uncontrolled thinking. We constantly think about things that are 
uh, distorted, if you will, immoral thinking, lustful thinking is distorted. Jesus said these come out of the heart or the uh, vain thinking is a uh, thinking that is double minded. We spoke about that. Twisted thoughts is when we call good evil and evil good. Tainted thoughts is when we have bitter and envy and strife in our hearts and, uh, and, and condemning thoughts. We saw that these are thoughts that derive from one that doesn't trust in God's love, doesn't trust in his word, doesn't even trust in uh, the love of believers. It is absolutely self, uh, super sensitive to self-consciousness, being so self-absorbed, missing out on, 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 on the love of God in our lives and how he wants us to love one another. Now, Paul gives uh, instruction to think on things that are godly. Because all these twisted thoughts are only going to bring more anxiety, more depression, more pain and heartache, and more stress on the body. And so he's saying now that you need to replace your thinking. It's not enough to say, remember, I'm not going to think about that. That's evil. I shouldn't be thinking about that. And although we should be saying these things, he wants us to replace them with good things because you can only think about something one at a time almost one at a time and your mind as soon as you finish thinking it engages with some other thought and so if we replace it with good thinking we have no more bad thinking to think about if we're thinking about the good things of God's word and who he is and what he wants us to think about there's no room for bad thinking and so God wants us to replace bad thinking with good thinking. And he gives us these eight things that we think about. First is whatsoever things are true. Things that are factual. Things that are fact, uh, not fictional. Things that are real, not fake. Things that are reality, not fantasy. Things that are actually being. Sometimes we think about things that imagination uh, takes control. And by the way, I failed to mention this last week, but God hates a mind that is full of false, wicked imaginations. And God wants that mind to be filled with truth. Amen. And what a way to fill it on the Word of God. Amen. And so next is honest, serious thinking. <laughs> uh, we looked at this word, is, uh, has another meaning here, to be honourable or worthy of respect. It means we ought not to waste our thoughts on silly and vain things. And we said that things that are worthy of thinking about is the will of God. Because at the end of the day, that's the very thing that's going to last forever. And then whatsoever things are just, right. And by the way, the best way to think on these things is the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs help us to deal with things that are just especially with our neighbor. We want to be men and women of uh, people of integrity. Okay, we want to do things that are right. And, and when you do things that is not uh, just and things that are not uh, honorable or full of integrity, then that alone can make you think distorted thinking. That alone that can discourage you and make you think evil thoughts. And so we see whatsoever things are pure. The only thing that's pure, by the way, is God and his word, Jesus Christ. And if we get a whole heap of meditation on his greatness and his holiness, we'll be a better for it. And whatsoever things are lovely, pleasant, things that are pleasing to God. And uh, so often we think about uh, the things that we don't have instead of thinking about the things that we do have. And, uh, and we said that the things that are lovely are the things uh, relating to eternal things, things that simply are godly. And then good report, things that are highly regarded. There are things that discourage us, and yes, we've got to deal with those things when they come. But we, we have to come to the point of our life and say, are we, are we really in the will of God? Is God really doing something amongst us? Is this all bad report or is this good report? Because sometimes the things that seem bad to us, God is saying, no, this is good. Because his thoughts are not our thoughts. And when you see what God is doing and you follow him, you start thinking, wow, this may be happening you know, in a very wrong way or a bad thing. But I'm reminded of Romans chapter 8, verse 28, that all things work together for good to them that love God. 
All things, even the bad things. And God wants to use those bad things for the good of his glory and for us. And, uh, and then we said virtue and praise, things that are excellent, praiseworthy. Uh, we ought not to uh, always express what's happening in our minds. Uh, uh, that could be a bad thing. Amen. We want to uh, uh, build up other people and we want to encourage other people in the most excellent way. And some things that we think about uh, are not worth repeating. We wonder and say, where did that come from? Well, <laughs> don't think it again and don't repeat it again. Just cast it down if it came from somewhere that uh, you, sh you, you yourself don't appreciate. Uh, just get rid of it. And uh, by the way, all these eight points point to Christ. He's true, honest, lovely. He's, uh, he's uh, uh, just. All of these things. And we looked at the thinking uh, that is good results into deliverance, being delivered uh, out of bondage of fear, depression and worry. So complete cure for an anxiety is to call, cry, be content and be consecrated in our thinking. In verse 9, we see another point here. And it's to be committed to the Lord. Have a look at verse 9. The two keys that God wants us in verse 6 to 8 is right praying and right living, uh, right thinking. The third key is right living. Look at verse 9. Those things which you have both learned, received and heard and seen in me. Look at this. What's that two-letter word? Uh, that, uh, two -letter word? Do. 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 And I've entitled the message that a two-letter word will change your life. Yeah, that's right. Just the two-letter word Amen. will change your life. Can I just say something? These all go hand in hand. These are the key. If we can get that picture up. Right praying, right thinking and right living is the very key and cure for anxiety. You can't have one without the other. They all have to come together. All three. One, two, three. You can't have right praying and not, and not have right thinking. And by the way, when you have the right living, all these two will come together. You could know about praying right and you could know about thinking right, but if you don't do them, it's for nothing. It's absolutely useless. Knowing, learning is not the key to growth. It's a start, but the key to growth is doing. Obeying. Which today we, we know that it highly undermined. Uh, you say, well, how do you know all these statistics? I only know for about six to seven years of being in this church and saying, is that all we hear? Trust and obey and exceed and go higher. So, well, that's all the Bible teaches right. from cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation. That's the uh, e epidemic that they had right from the beginning. Uh, Eve and Adam sinned and look where we are. They disobeyed God. That's the problem, folks. And that's the problem to depression and worry and anxiety is because people just won't do what God is telling them to do. That's the problem. We can't blame it on anything else. That's the problem right there. And God wants us to be cured, but we cannot be cured if we don't obey him. That's the key. This is where the rubber meets the road. This is what separates the men from the boys. This is it, right here. You can have all the knowledge, you can have all the learning, but if you don't live out what you know and what you've been taught, it's a waste of time and it won't unlock nothing. It just won't work. It won't work. You have to learn how to obey. This is, if you will, the test of faith, if you will. Uh, this is the very thing that's going to make the difference in our lives when we start not only uh, uh, learning but applying what we know. Someone said the cost of obedience is nothing compared with the cost of disobedience. The Bible says by the sin of one man, sin entered into the world by, by Adam and death passed upon all men for all have sinned and we know that was the sin of disobedience. 
And throughout the scripture, we see that obedience is the key to true godliness and blessing. Throughout the scripture, John taught on this subject. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 20, notice what the Bible says there. He says, for if our heart condemn us. Remember, we looked at this. We looked at this last week, but we have to finish it. God is greater than our hearts and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not. Look at this. He says, if our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we, what? Keep his commandments and, what's the two-letter word? Do those things that are pleasing in his sight. You know what John is saying? He's saying if we want confidence toward God, then we must keep his word. Yes. That's, how, that's how confidence comes. And that's how uh, this condemning heart that condemns me can be just sim simply uh, shifted, gone, laid aside when I say, you know what? I want to start obeying God. I want to start obeying his word. Notice in verse 23, John is more specific. He says, and this is the commandment that we should believe on his son and love one another as he gave us commandment. More specific, have faith in Jesus Christ and have fervent love for your brother. I guarantee you, if you don't have these two things lived out in your life, you're going to be depressed and worried and fearful for the rest of your life, Christian. Throughout the scriptures, we see the same admonition given for divine blessing from God. We see it through and through. <clears throat> Jesus taught this. Jesus, have a look at... Uh, uh, Matthew, go to, go, go to Matthew if you will. Matthew chapter 7. And I want you to keep in mind what Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount is everything Paul covered. I want you to understand that in the context of what Jesus preached right from the beginning on the Sermon on the Mount, Paul covered in his letter. Remember in chapter 1, Paul was dealing with those persecutors and then in the Sermon on the Mount, right in the beginning, Jesus says, blessed are you that are persecuted for righteousness sake and for my sake. So deal, Jesus deals with that. In chapter 2 of Paul's epistle, he's dealing with selfishness and to have a mind of Christ and, and living the mind of Christ, and Jesus deals with, deals with that as well. Talking about the second mile Christian. He deals with that. To be so selfless and Christ-like, because we understand that the second mile Christianity only can be lived through the, through the life of Christ. And we see not only he dealing with those things, but Paul deals with dogs. Remember he dealt with dogs, uh, evil workers, evil teachers creeping into the church, and Jesus deals with that on the Sermon on the Mount. He says, don't cast that which is holy to the dogs. Okay, so he's dealing with it. Uh, by the way, Jesus is dealing with worry in chapter 6. He deals with worry. And he deals how to uh, shift your eyes upon him. And to put him first and seek him first and God will take care of you. Now, he gives all this teaching. Paul is echoing, if you will, the Sermon on the Mount, in, in a sense. Uh, this tells us that there's nothing new under the sun. And this tells us that the same problem that they're going to have back then is the same problem that we're going to have now. But then Jesus closes with, lo and behold, obedience. Have a look at Matthew chapter 7. And in verse 24, gives a parable even. Matthew chapter 7, verse 24, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and, what's that word? Doeth. Doeth them, I will liken him unto a, who? Wise man, which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not. Jesus gives three contrasts. The wise from the foolish, the rock foundation with the sand the sandy foundation and the two results at the end of it. And the two result of each is what matters in our context of preaching this morning. Right. It's what matters. And he goes and says that a wise man is one that hears the word and does it. 
He's the one that's going to build on a foundation that is firm and fixed. And come what may, it will stand. Because he's obeyed the very word of God. That's the key. That's the key. That the, the problems will come and persecution will come and discouragements will come. But because I'm obeying the very word of God, I will be fixed and focused to the end. I'm not going to be down and out. I'm not going to be, oh no, what do I do? No. I'm obeying the very word of God that's revealed to me and God is blessing me for it. He's given me grace. He's helping me. It's, my house is being built on a firm foundation. It's not shifting sand. It's solid and fixed. The contrast of that is the foolish man. The foolish in verse 26. Have a look. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them. What's that word? Not. Shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon a sand. The rain descended. The floods came. The winds blew and beat upon the house. And it fell. But look at this. And great was the fall of it. Two people under the same circumstances to end results. And I want to know how you can get two people under the sound preaching of the word of God. One responds this way and one responds that way. How's that happen? I'll tell you how it happened. One of them is actually believing the word of God and living it. That's how it's happening. The other one, hearing, acknowledging, maybe arguing with the Word of God. I'll tell you something, if you ever argue with the Word of God, you're on a downhill spiral from right there. If you ever argue with the Word of God, if you try to correct the Word of God or argue the Word of God and say, oh, this didn't really say that and that didn't really say this, it really means this. It's called convenient Christianity where you try to get the Word of God to make your lifestyle comfortable. But, you know, the Word of God interrupts our lives and we are uncomfortable. But the Spirit loves it. (laughs) The Spirit loves it. He's the Word of truth, says that's right. But the difference is, is living it and doing what you know and what you say amen to is living out those things. God wants us to live. What will happen to a foolish man? Hears it and doesn't obey it. When it comes time to testing, see you later. Go on with the wind. Finished. Doesn't last, won't stand. So Jesus teaches on this. By the way, the more we know, the more accountable we are. And, and, and for, our dis, for our destruction. So the more we know, the more accountable we are. We need to do what we know. So we're, 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 we're wise builders. Building on that foundation, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. James talks about this. If you have a look at James chapter 4. James chapter 4. By the way, Matthew, or the Sermon on the Mount, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 7, and James chapter 1 are the golden passages for obedience. I mean, I'll look out throughout the scriptures and you can't get it more clear teaching on obedience than these two passages. But we're going to look at James chapter 4 before we get into James chapter 1 for this purpose. What is the opposite of peace? What's the opposite of peace? War. And so James talks to these Christians saying, you know why there's so much war in your hearts? You know why? Because they weren't doing what Paul was telling the church at Philippi to do. As a matter of fact, we're going to look into the passage and they were doing quite the opposite. You know why they've never, they never have peace in their hearts? You know why people, why Christians never have peace in their hearts? Because they have the right, wrong kind of praying, the wrong kind of thinking, and the wrong kind of living. That's why. I'm talking about true peace. Not fabricated, not put on, not one, minute, one day I'm like this and the other day I'm like this. I'm talking about true peace, even in the midst of a stormy trial. We'll have a look at James chapter 4. Look what he says. From whence come, what's that word? 
wars and fightings among you, come they not hence, even from your lusts, that war in your members? Wrong kind of thinking. Verse 2, ye lust and ye have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain, ye fight and war and yet, <coughs> and ye have not because ye ask not. Verse 3, and ye ask and receive not because ye ask a what? A mess that ye may consume it upon your own lust. Wrong kind of praying. And look at chapter, uh, uh, look at verse 4. Wrong kind of living. Ye adulteress ado- uh, and adulteresses. Know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. How can you have peace, my friend, if you are enemies with God? No way in the world. And so in James chapter 1, he has to start, he's not actually concluding, he's actually beginning with saying, you need to be doers of the word. He starts off by saying, that's the key. And have a look at verse 22. But be ye, what's that word? Doers of the word and not hearers only. What's that word? Deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like an, a man beholding his natural face in a glass or a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But look at verse 5. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty, over here, and continueth therein, he be not a forgetful hearer, but a what? Doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. That's the key. That's the key right here. To be blessed, to have God's blessing upon your life, is to do or live out or practice what you have heard, what you have been taught. And James says, if you don't, then this is how it's like. It's like a person beholding their face in a mirror, in a glass, and he looks and he sees all the deformed things in his life. Let's just say one of these are the fear of persecution. Another one is selfishness. Another one is embracing false doctrine. And another one is causing disunity. So I've got all these things attacking my heart and mind. They're troubling me. I don't deal with them according to the word of God. This is how he says, I'll just look in the mirror and I'll just continue doing what I was doing. How would you how would you think? What what would you say or think if you saw me walk through that door to church today just looking like this? Say, Charlie, you missed something here. (laughs) Why won't you say that? There's something here that you haven't been dealing with. There's something here. And so what God is saying is that there's certain things in your life that you have to do and you're not doing them. It's like this. You don't even recognize them. You're deceiving yourself. You don't even recognize them to clear them up or to find these biblical principles that we've been learning about. To apply them in your life. Not just hear them and and say, yeah, amen and, and, and amen for that. But to actually go out and now live them in your life. To go do them and practice practice them. Because I'll tell you something. I can tell you that the first thing that you need to do is go to the Lord in prayer and cry out. And when you do, you say, God, help me. God, please. Pleading with the Lord. There's this weakness in my heart and mind. I'm governed by this sin or whatever it is that's gripping your heart. And you're crying out to God. That's, That's a good thing. This is what happens. When you apply, you start... God starts giving you peace. But there's other things in my life. There's other things like disunity. Someone that I need to forgive or someone that I need to reconcile. And I'm so stubborn. Did you know Christians can be so stubborn years upon years upon years and never get it right? Never. And they go to churches and they say hi brothers and sisters to other people in other churches that don't know their problem. And they're walking around like this. I'm sorry, but that's what's taking place. They're walking around like this. 
You're deceiving yourself. You are deceiving yourself. You're not deceiving God. You're deceiving yourself. You know when I reconcile Bob away? Be the same mind in the Lord. Being, by the way, being the same mind in the Lord doesn't necessarily mean that we have to get on with everything that we perceive to be right. There's some things, mind you, that we won't split hairs over. And that's fine. But there are things that God wants you to fix. And you can't let that be hanging over your head. Remember, that's unfinished business creates anxiety, trouble in your heart and your soul. And the worst thing that you could do is put it under the carpet and pretend it doesn't exist. Piles up. You've got to deal with them. And when you deal with them right, you're actually just fixing the things that God wants you to fix. You know, when you look into the Word of God and God shows you, you know, from the preaching, you're, you're under the Word of God. This is what it means, that you're under the Word of God right now. And then in your devotional time and you're learning, you're in the Word of God. And God shows you something. And God is touching on something and, 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 and pointing out on something. Be quick to obey. And that's dealing. You're not deceiving yourself there. As a matter of fact, God will give you grace to be able to handle those things that you give to him. And give you peace. When we look into the mirror of God's word, we look for a purpose. And that purpose is God, show me. Show me what I need to get right. Show me how I need to continue to do things right. Show me, dear God, how I can come and cry to you and you deal with these bad thinking. Oh, brothers and sisters, we, every day we are bombarded with bad thinking. Every day. Every day thoughts come into our minds regarding our brethren and our family and our wives and our kids. And every day thinking, wrong thinking comes into our mind. It's not once a week, it's every day. And it's, it's knowing how to have God's peace when they do come. How? Right praying, right thinking, doing. Doing is the key. Obeying. If we go back to Philippians chapter 4, verse 9, and notice the two things that Paul wanted the church to live out. Have a look. Have a look in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9. He says this. He says, those things which ye have both learned and received. That's the first thing. Do. In other words... Paul is talking about his teaching. The second part of that, he says, the things that you have heard and seen. Paul is talking about his testimony. Let's look at the first, his teaching. You know, this church, in reality, had one apostle at that particular time. We can even say one letter that was given to them at that particular time. One apostle, really, in reality, one letter given to the church at Philippi. And he said, thus far, my teaching to you, what I have given you through this letter, do it. I want you to do it. It wasn't about ignorance. They learnt. He taught them. It was more about arrogance. They had to now live out what Paul was telling them to do. There's the difference. Church, our problem is not, oh, we don't have enough teaching. You have more than what the church at Philippi had. Yes, more than what the church at Philippi had. Yeah, that's right. The problem is not about we're not getting fed and we're not being taught. You've got the Apostle Peter. You have the Apostle John. You have, the, you have Jude. You have Paul. You have more than one epistle, instruction, left, right and centre. Sunday morning, Sunday night, devotion, Wednesday, devotion, Friday and more. What's the problem? Not the word, the heart. It's not doing. It's not believing. It's not practising. It's not following through. Forgetful hearers until the next time and the next time. 
and the next time and the next time and the next time. You know, if all you did is obey the very thing from get go, the preaching of the word, when you foot, mate, if all you did was obey the little that you had, you'll be growing and growing and growing. If you just obeyed the little that you know. It, it wasn't about uh, ignorance. They had the word of God. It wasn't about accepting the truth. They received it. It was applying it. That was the key. You know what, what brings to mind not only what we have. We have a banquet of God's word. I mean, Israel had the banquet of God's word. Prophet after prophet after prophet. But we have the prophets and the apostles. And I want to I I I get your attention to a widowed woman. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 15. I want, uh, this widow woman not only blows me away, I, I can see why Jesus marveled at her. I can see why. <laughs> I can see why two people in the Bible that made Jesus marvel. And if we want to bring it down to the English vocabulary, he could have said, wow. <laughs> wow. At what? Well, we'll have a look. Matthew chapter 15, verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sodom. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast. And uh, what she do? What she do? Very good. She cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and what's that word? Looks like she's crying out, worshipping, thanksgiving, saying, Lord, what's that word? Right kind of thinking. She's going to the right kind of per, the right person. But he answered and said, Look at this. It is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. The Gentiles at that particular time were the outside outside of the Commonwealth of Israel, considered to be the outcast of society. But notice her response, which made Jesus marvel, verse 27, and she said, Truth. She agreed. How dare you say that? No. She agreed with the word of God. Had no problems with it. I said she had no problems with the word of God. She agreed with it. She said, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the ma their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said, O woman, <laughs> great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. What was going on here? You know what she was saying? I'll take whatever you give me, Lord. Amen. I'll take the crumbs. Give me whatever's left over. <laughs> and you, and you know, some people can identify with her. You know, in some countries, they probably only have like two pages of the Bible. One book of the Bible. How many Bibles do we have in, the home, in our home? Three on our shelf, our phones, all over the place. We are, it's not a, look, listen, brethren, it's not about being accessible to the Word of God. It's not about being fed. I mean, some of you are matured Christians. I'm sure you know how to eat. And, you, and, 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 and your job is, hey, let's reach people and get them so they can be under the Word of God so they can grow and mature and not just toss them to and fro with every wind of doctrine. But you know why the Christian is anemic and is not growing and is struggling like as if he was a babe? Because he's not doing. The very little that they know amongst this broad knowledge. That's the problem. And Jesus marveled, stood back and said, Whoa, what great faith. Because she just wanted whatever the Lord gave her. She was willing to embrace it. Say, Lord, I'll take whatever you give me. 
Whatever, whatever you give me. You know what Spurgeon said? He said, faith and obedience are bound up in the same bundle. He that obeys God trusts God. And he that trusts God obeys God. And that's so true. But notice now Paul's testimony. Verse 9, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and see in me, what? do. So in other words, they would have heard about Paul and what was taking place in his life. Look, at Epaphroditus would have told them what happened. Epaphroditus would have come to Paul, Paul, this is what's taking place in the church. The church was initially going to Paul to help him and giving him physical uh, 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 things to meet his need. And at the same time, Epaphroditus would have taken on the liberty to say, the church is struggling. They heard about you in prison. They heard that you're, you're, you're in prison and they have you and they're worried about you. Just go tell them that this is happening to the gospel. Whatsoever things are lovely. <laughs> Amen? Uh, they're concerned for you. They're being persecuted like you're being persecuted. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Whatsoever things are lovely. I mean, this is the testimony that Epaphroditus would have went back and not only in his own uh, uh, ears heard this, but they saw it in the writing. I know it could have been the most beautiful thing, perhaps, that as soon as he heard the trouble that was taking place in the church, knowing Paul, he would have had a three men pre meeting in that prison. The church is divided, there's some creeps creeping in, dividing the church. It's so easy for me and him. Oh, no! Oh! I can see Paul. Let's have a prayer meeting. Paul, Epaphroditus, and the guard that he was chained up to. Forced to have a prayer meeting. <laughs> by then he probably would have been saved, by the way. Knowing Paul. You, 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 you've heard and seen me. You live like me. This, this is the peace of God. And you know who else witnessed this? Great vision. Bird's eye view. The Philippian jailer. Remember that? Go back to Acts chapter 16. Have a look in Acts chapter 16. And look at verse 22. Acts 16 and look at verse 22. And the multitude rise up. This is when they were uh, captured, if you will. Paul and Silas, they rose up against Paul and Silas and the magistrate rent off their clothes and commanded to, be, to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet, feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas, what they do? Prayed. And uh, what they do next? Sung with thanksgiving. <laughs> and the prisoners heard them. That would have heard what was taking place. It would have been the talk of the town. Yeah. I mean, Paul was faced with trouble, beaten, bruised. Talk about being pressed down, sick, sick. Sometimes when we're sick, we can't even lift up our head and pray. Yeah. Well, this guy was beaten. And they knelt and prayed. They heard the pray. They heard the praising, and not long after that, they heard the preaching. What must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. The persecution didn't stop Paul from preaching. He kept living and living and living what he preached. And he says, what I do, what you've seen and hear in my life, do it. That's all he was saying. Do it. What, what confidence can a man say, take, follow my example? I mean, to reach that point to say, do what I do, has to be, has to be somebody that was actually practicing what they were preaching. What confidence? But that's the confidence that God gives us when we keep his word and we do that which pleases him. And our heart won't condemn us. Paul was a perfect example of that. Someone said, we learn more by five minutes of obedience than by ten years study. Yeah, that's right. 
You can study for 10 years, my friend, but if you don't do what you study, it's for nothing. Jesus said, if you know these things, happy are ye that if you do them. If you know them, you're going to be joyful when you do them. Someone said, the first duty of every soul is to find not its freedom, but its master. People are looking for a way out. Freedom, liberty. Obey the Lord. There's freedom there. Oh, obey, obey. Trust and obey. So we're here. That's the remedy. That's all you're going to hear. Nothing different. (laughs) Nothing. Got nothing for you. That's all it is. (laughs) You want to live a victorious life? Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. Obedience is the key to complete cure for anxiety. We're closing. Notice the result. Notice the conclusion. When a person has the right kind of praying and the right kind of thinking and the right kind of living, have a look at the last part there of verse 9. Those things which you have both heard and received Uh, learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. What's the conclusion? And the God of peace shall be with you. The God of peace. You know, in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, talks about we've been justified by faith. Through who? Through Jesus Christ. And therefore we have peace with God. Philippians chapter uh, uh, 4 verse 7 talks about if we come to God in prayer that we're going to have the peace of God. But when we do, we have the God of peace. You know what that means? We have God's presence in our life. The peace of God guides, uh, guards us from the trouble and the noise. We're guarded. The peace of God guides us. We're moving forward. We're moving forward. Christian, do you really just want to stay here for the rest of your life? Guarded, protected. God wants more for you. God wants you to overcome these thinkings, these evil things. He wants you to get victory. He doesn't only want to guard you. He wants to guide you. Having God's presence in your life, that's key. It's one thing to be peace, to have peace with God. It's another thing to have the peace of God. But my friend, it's a grand thing to have the God of peace with me. That's something else. (laughs) Salvation, peace with God. Sanctification, if you like, the peace of God. In my at least in my heart and mind. But the very presence of God is actually living out the word of God. That's something that we're losing. And our tw- 21st century Christianity. That's something yep. that we're losing. Yep. I think Psalm 15, we have time. Psalm 15 will just wrap up, wrap up what Paul is trying to say. Okay? Let's have a look just quickly and we're done. Psalm 15, look at verse 1. Psalm of David, Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? In other words, who's, who's going to be in your presence? Who's that, who's that person that will be in your presence, having the God of peace govern their life? Who is it? Who is it? Gives the answer. He that walketh 
uprightly. He that worketh righteously. He that speaketh truth, where? In his heart. He, uh, he that backbiteth not with his tongue or doeth evil to his neighbour. Big one. Nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbour. In whose eyes a vile person is contempt. But he honoureth him that, what? Fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. It's one mind. He that putteth not out his money to usury doesn't cheat his brother. He's just, doesn't cheat him. Doesn't try to profit from his brothers. Nor taketh reward against the innocent. Doesn't take advantage of the poor. And he that doeth these things shall what? Never be moved. Never. My mind is girded up. <laughs> Gird up the loins of your mind. Sober, minded, confidence. Not to and fro, wishy washy, fixed. Why? Because living what we're hearing and what we're being taught, we're living it. And that person will be in God's will, in His presence. That person would not only be peace with God, having the peace of God, but listen, we'll have the very God of peace. And that, my friend, is something that when we get it and we understand what it is, we say, please don't let me go. Let, let me have this more. When you understand the presence of God in your life, and then it's so easily lost the next day. Just like that. It's gone. And just by one word, one thought, gets rid of the presence of God. Just one. And my friend, it's not coming into the presence of God when we know we're about to preach or do something for God. That's deceitful. It's practicing the presence of God every moment of every day. That's key. I don't want to lose it. I don't... Because I know when I don't have the God of peace with me. Yeah, that's right. I know. Yeah. My tongue got me in trouble. My thinking got me in trouble. And then we have to hear another message. No, you don't. Yeah. Just have to do it. Yeah. That's all. Two letter words that would change your life. Do. What you learn. Complete peace. The God of peace. Yeah. The complete cure for anxiety. Amen. Amen? Right. Let's pray.